welcome. Thanks for joining us as we spotlight the Jesuit community at Holy Cross. I'm Father Keith Maskowitz, Assistant Chaplain for Liturgy and the very proud chaplain uh, for the first year class of 2024. And today I'm joined by my brother Jesuit and fellow office mate in the chaplain's office, Father Jim Hayes. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Keith. Long time no see. <laughs> we just had breakfast together. Uh, under normal circumstances, Jim and I would, we would have staged this sitting across from each other, perhaps in the Jesuit residence somewhere or uh, in Campion House. But as we all know, these are not normal circumstances. So we're taking advantage of technology to come to you today. Jim Hayes probably doesn't need much of an introduction. He's known to so many of you. Jim is a proud alumnus of the class of 1972. He serves as the Associate Chaplain of Faith Formation. He entered the Jesuits in August 1975, 45 years ago this past summer, and has ministered at various locations over the years, most notably uh, in Jamaica at Fairfield University, my own alma mater, uh, and for the Society of Jesus of New England, where he served as vocation director. And of course, he's been a long time on the staff here at Holy Cross. So we welcome Jim, uh, and we're going to jump right into a few questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Jim, I know you grew up in Michigan, in Gross Point, which we've talked about many times. Um, so as a Midwesterner, how did the college and Worcester, uh, how did it get on your radar? Well, it's, it was always part of my radar in the sense that my dad went to Holy Cross. He was actually class of 1932. And so I'd always heard about it, but um, it was really my mother who pushed Holy Cross because she used to come to reunions and she always was impressed with Holy Cross men. She thought they were good Christian gentlemen. And so she encouraged me to apply early decision, which I did. And um, the summer of my junior year, my buddy and I came out east and we looked at colleges. And when I came to Holy Cross, I said, this is it. So I applied early decision, found out on the day after Thanksgiving and Senior year was worry-free. <laughs> you and your dad ever talk about your experience as a Holy Cross? I think I remember you saying something about your dad's experience and yours not exactly the same. No, I mean, when he went, it, it was, Holy Cross was a, a little bit of a uh, prison, I think, you know. And <laughs> um, So he had, you know, he, he had some wonderful friends and he did get a good education and, um, um, but it, it was pretty restrictive back then. And uh, so we did have different experiences. Well, I'm amazed how many students are here from Gross Point, Michigan, or right around that area now. So it's, uh, there's something about it, the... It, it's, it's unusual. I mean, over the years, uh, well, when I was a student here, there was one guy from my hometown. He had gone to a different high school. And, you know, a few years later, I hear about some, but it hasn't been, Michigan has not been a big feeding ground for Holy Cross, unlike Chicago or Cleveland. Uh, so I'm glad to see a few more these days. Yeah. Interesting. When you were a student here, you were in um, ROTC. Um, right. When you were in ROTC, you learned that your, your older brother tragically died in Vietnam, I think in 1970. Um, can you talk about kind of your reaction to that news? What was it like to lose a loved one in that way? Right. So um, my at the end of my freshman year in 1969, my brother married his sweetheart and I was the best man. And it was just such a joyous wedding. It was just, and it's such a gorgeous day. And, um, and you know, when he got orders for Vietnam, my family was very worried about him, but I, I just said, oh no, I mean, he had this wonderful wedding, God is gonna watch over him and protect him. And I have to say it was my first crisis of faith, you know, because I really did not believe anything would happen to him. But um, I remember after we got the news and I, and I remember saying to God, God, how could you let this happen? And I distinctly heard God say to me, Vietnam was not my idea. It was our idea, you know? And um, so I never 
you know, I never blamed God. In fact, um, it was a very powerful experience of, uh, of solidarity on the part of friends and family and uh, a, a time of, paradoxically, of consolation, you know. Um, I knew my brother was a good man and, and died heroically. And, you know, I, I just knew he was home with God. So, and the good news was that I was home already for the summer when it happened. So that was very important. I mean, if I had been back at school, it, it would have been a lot more difficult. So. Yeah. Do you have any memory of Jesuits kind of ministering to you in the wake of that? Yes. Uh, two Jesuits came to the funeral, as well as one of my lay professors. So that made a big impact. But the others, uh, many wrote to me or called me and just supported me in, in, in my hour. And um, that made a big difference in my life. So. Yeah. And how old was your brother when he died? 24. 24. And his, uh, his wife was pregnant. So, and I became the godfather of his son, who is Neil B. Hayes III. And happily, my sister-in-law met a wonderful man who had been adopted himself. And he, he's been a great father to my nephew. And they, he, my nephew has three half-brothers. So it was kind of a happy ending in that yeah. sense. Out of death came new life, as it were. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Now, a couple of weeks ago, you and I did uh, a baptism together for a colleague of ours who's uh, had a daughter in the spring, Omandi. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of the homily, I asked, what do, what do people want to be when they grew up? And you said, I wanted to be an architect right. when you were a kid. So when did you first start feeling the call to uh, priesthood? Well, actually, I, my, uh, probably from the age of eight to 12, I did want to be a priest. So that, that uh, maybe I should have said that, but, you know, then once puberty hit and, you know, we were, there were boy girl parties and, you know, I sort of let the, you know, the priesthood thing slip to the side. And I really, I was fascinated by architecture and um, buildings and um, design. And so that was my, my uh, game plan. So what, what switched you back to this priesthood idea? Well, I, again, I think it was my older brother's death. Um, you know, I, I did, I, I had three years in the Navy to face after Holy Cross and um, the very first week in the Navy, it was June 30th, 1972, I'll, I'll never forget. I was out for a walk on the Norfolk Naval Base and it was a beautiful night and this incredible feeling of peace came over me and a voice said, you're going to be a Jesuit priest. And I was like blown away. But I now think it was probably my brother speaking to me. And um, so for six months, I, I never told anyone about it. And then I finally started broaching it with, with people that I trusted, including a Jesuit I trusted. And he kind of tried to play devil's advocate and said, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? But we were doing this all through mail. And um, so finally, I just, one day I went to St. Joe's Prep in Philly because I was home ported in Philly. And uh, I just said, I need to talk to a Jesuit. And, you know, the man I, I got to know became my spiritual director and got me involved in the candidates program. And, you know, I still had two and a half years of the Navy. And, um, you know, they just said, do what you're doing. Be the best Naval officer you can be and, and, and test this out. And I did, and it just kept growing from this seed of a voice that spoke to me that night. Seems so quaint to have done that all through the mail at one point. Yes, yes, all through <laughs> the mail. I still have some of those letters that he wrote to me. You know? That does not surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Was it always the Jesuits? Did you think about diocesan priesthood or the Dominicans or anything like that? Well, that's what he kept pushing me. What about, you know, this group or that group? But, but the voice was so clear, you know, you're going to be a Jesuit priest. So, um, no, I didn't think of any, any place other than the Jesuits. So. Yeah. That story of, of, your, of the calling that you heard, it's very, very challenging for some of our students who really want to hear that voice, you know, and they, know. Know. I've heard them say, they say, Father Hayes got a voice and I'm still waiting. <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, as I say, I, I really think it was my brother's voice, you know, mm -hmm. and he was very concerned, you know, like he was concerned about whether the Navy was a great idea. In fact, he had written a, a, an open letter to my brothers before he left for Vietnam. And in the letter, he said, is Jim still thinking about the priesthood? Is the Navy the right to sit choice for him? You know, I wasn't thinking about the priesthood. <laughs> I thought, what's, that? what's he talking about? You know, mm. so I don't know. Interesting. Well, you've been in the Jesuits now, we said, 45 years. Yes. Uh, and you recently, this year, you turned 70. Um, I did. Has there been, can you pick maybe one experience or one moment during your Jesuit life that, you know, if you had to pick one moment that sticks out to you, whether it's, you know, for good or for bad, or, but what's the one moment that you kind of always go back to? Well, I, I actually think it was uh, my long experiment as a tertian. I, I was sent to Uganda and I was assigned to an AIDS clinic in uh, a hospital in Kampala. And uh, at the time, Kampala was 45% HIV positive. I mean, U Uganda was just hit very hard by AIDS. And so at the hospital, we had about 2,500 to 3,000 uh, patients and, and they could come on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday for medication, for food, for counseling, for job um, training. And, um, but on Monday and Friday, uh, a nurse and I and a driver would go out to visit the ones who couldn't, you know, who were too sick to come in. And um, Uganda is mostly Catholic. So I was anointing and bringing communion to so many very sick people, mostly young heterosexual couples, you know? Mm. And, you know, it, surprisingly, it was a very consoling experience to know that I was preparing them to meet their Lord. Mm. And it just, it was really powerful and uh, a kind of a wow experience, I'd say. What year, what year would that have been, Jim? That was 92, 93. So, you know, AIDS was still pretty widespread. Uh, yeah, especially on the continent. In on, yeah, the, on con the continent there. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Jim, you, you used a phrase that maybe people don't know. So what, what is tertianship? Can you explain what that is oh, briefly? Okay, so um, for a Jesuit, the first two years are the novitiate, and it's a series of experiments, including the 30-day retreat. And then at the end of your formation, you do tertiate, which literally means third, your third year or your third probation. And um, so it's usually, it, it, the programs vary, but mine was a nine-month program, and four months was in Detroit, and five months was sent we were spent, sent elsewhere. And there were 12 in the class, six were from outside the United States and six were from the States. So the ones from the States went out of the country and the ones from out of the country stayed in the country for their five month experiment, so. Thanks. Um, you've spent a lot of years in your Jesuit life ministering to young adults, first at Fairfield and multiple stints here. Uh, at Holy Cross. You do a lot of sacramental work here on the campus, but you also are doing a lot of preparation. You're preparing a lot of students to enter the church, to receive their sacraments. 
Um, so you're doing a lot of teaching, as it were, uh, about the faith. So I wonder, you know, working with young people, how has that influenced you? And maybe what have they been teaching you as you've been kind of teaching them? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think they, they teach me about the culture, you know, how the culture evolves and how faith needs to be enculturated and, and incarnated. So, you know, I, I always emphasize that what's most important is that we get to know Jesus, that, that he becomes someone real to them. And so I want to tap into their experiences of what they found authentic in terms of relationship and, and things. So, so I think they mostly they teach me about um, hope and they teach me about our culture, which is constantly evolving. Yeah, I, I would have to agree. You know, I don't have as many years working with young people as you, but uh, they know a lot more about it than, than we do. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, I might ask you just one other thing about the, the ministry you do here at Holy Cross. Um, I know you do this, uh, a grief support group. Uh, right. And, you know, as we've talked just this morning and knowing you as I do, grief has been part of your narrative, part of your own story. Can you talk a little bit about that work that you do? Yes, and I, you know, I, I think it's a playing forward of that experience of the Jesuits, you know, ministering to me when I was at uh, a, a moment of need. And um, one of my favorite sayings is, treat the dead as if they're alive and treat the living as if they're dying. So the communion of saints is one of my deepest held beliefs that we are surrounded by our loved ones and they are watching us, they're praying for us, but they're also waiting for us to invoke them. And so I, I always want to encourage the uh, students who have had a significant loss that they grieve this loss, but they still have faith that these people have not been lost completely. You know, they're still available and still present in their lives. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really important ministry. I think the students here are carry they carry a lot, and we don't always know what it is. Right. You know, back in back in January when the um, the crew team had their accident in Florida, I I had I was on retreat with students, and I came to understand that Father Burroughs, you and Mary Beth Kearns Barrett, the director of our office all flew to Florida. And I thought, oh, thank God, Jim, Jim Hayes is going. <laughs> because this is the type of work where you're, you're really effective and you are, um, you have a very good way about you, of course, but also your, you know, it's, it's more of like your philosophy here and like your deep belief in this community of saints really helps people to kind of deal. Thank you. Thank you. It, it, it was really like Uganda in a way, you know, because all these, women in the hospital, you know, who have been so injured and traumatized and, it, but God is there, you know, God comes through and it's such a privilege to let God work through us, you know. Hmm. Yes. What's the most difficult part about your Jesuit life? You know, the most difficult has been losing people I've loved, I mean, not not through death, but people have decided to leave the Jesuits, you know, people I had been very close to. And, and you know, you, you're able to maintain some of those relationships, but it's just not the same, you know, uh, where, when, you're, when you're in the society together, it's this bond that you have. And if they choose to leave, um, you can still stay connected, but it's not as rich as it would have been if you were still Jesuit. So the loss of those brothers, and maybe it, it's because it, it dredges up my own loss of my brother, because I, I feel like God has given me all these older brothers, you know, in the Jesuits. And um, of course, now I'm reaching the age of being the older brother. You know? <laughs> So, uh, but that's been the hardest thing. Hmm. 
what's been what's been the best thing about 45 years in Jesuit life? Well, I I just think it's such a rich um, experience of friendship, of learning, of formation, of travel, of going so many places in the world. And they're Jesuits, and you feel this immediate bond. I mean, I spent five months in India too, and that was so rich. And I, you know, I spent three years in Canada with all sorts of Jesuits from other parts of the world, and um, and then the four years in Jamaica, and so just the fact that we are so many places, and and you you connect immediately through that. Yeah. Yeah, that's been true of my own experience just in, you know, very diverse uh, formation communities. Right. We, there, there is a common language and, and common experiences that really do bond us. Definitely. Uh, let's, let's talk just briefly about kind of the present moment we're in and, you know, yes. the, with the pandemic and we're in the middle of a very intense election cycle. And right. uh, it's, we're in difficult times here. There's kind of no, no denying it. Uh, certainly for our world, for our nation, closer to home, for our campus community. Um, what are, wh how do you get through these days? What are, where do you find hope in these kind of troubling times? Uh, well, I would say, uh, first of all, I just try to live one day at a time. You know, I don't want to look ahead too much because it just causes anxiety. Um, and, you know, I, my prayer life has really expanded during this time. And that, because whenever I turn to prayer, you know, I find God encouraging me and saying, take my yoke, you know, we'll get through this, trust me, you know, this too will pass, all those things. Um, so, um, you know, it's my prayer is really what, gets me through and 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 just trying to live i mean that's all we have is the the present moment you know and and so this is a real discipline for me to try to just live today and not think too much about what lies ahead you know do you feel like that um do you feel like that's the result of a life well lived i'm finding it as a younger person it's difficult to live one like one day at a time yeah you know? well i think it's I have a little more practice at it than you, but um, it's still hard for me. So it's a discipline. It is, yeah. Um, I think we have time for maybe another question or so. Um, I wonder about like vocation work. So you were vocation director for the right. province. Right. Um, you know, I think sometimes people look at Holy Cross and we're doing this kind of expose or these interviews and there's, there's only 13 men in the community. And sometimes right. people are like, it's very small, you know, but what's your kind of sense of vocations in the society and what's your hope and what would you say to someone who's considering like life as a Jesuit? Well, you know, I, the good news, when I was vocation director, I had uh, some, you know, good experiences of ministry under my belt because it could get very discouraging. I was vocation director during the clerical sex abuse crisis, you know, and, and if I had to, you know, depend on my work to give me, you know, joy and motivation and all that, it, it would have been tough. Um, but, you know, I could look back on some wonderful experiences of ministry that could draw, I could draw on, but I've had such a great life as a Jesuit. And, and I think, so many young men focus too much on what they're going to sacrifice and they have no clue about what they're going to get, what, you know, the blessings that they're going to receive as Jesuits. So, you know, I, I, I want to encourage it, you know, if, and, and they say that, you know, one of the most important things you can do is to tell someone, Hey, you know, you'd make a great Jesuit, you know, and even if they don't choose that, I think it's important for people to hear that. Hmm. Yes, one study out there says a man won't consider being a priest until someone until he's heard it from three different people. Yes, I believe it. Yes, fascinating. Yeah. 
speaking of giving things up, my mother, the day I entered, my mother bawled the whole time. I mean, she just completely cried for the entire day uh, because all she could think about was, well, what all the things I was quote unquote giving up, you know? Right, right. And I, I don't think about it that way, you know? But, yeah. My mother did not cry. <laughs> Oh, well, she loved Holy Cross and loved Holy Cross Man, so she knew yes. you were, you were well-formed, certainly. Yes. Well, I don't know about your generation, but in my generation in the society, we talk about having Jesuit heroes and, like, men that we kind of look up to. And, Jim, I have to say, you're one of mine. Oh, um, thank, I've, you. thank you. <laughs> I've gotten to live and work with you now uh, two different times in my life, but I've also known you s for a while. Yes. Um, just yes. through uh, various people, especially at Fairfield that you know yes. and right um, it's it's a great joy you know we're all stuck in the house together but it's right. you're a you're a good person to live with and i i, I want to thank you thank for your brotherhood you. thank you so much keith likewise so, oh thank you so it's thanks again for spending this time with us giving our alumni and friends a glimpse a little bit of what it's like to be a jesuit here uh, at holy cross and our campus community in addition to our jesuit community is a better place because you're in it thank you very much keith this has been fun thank you yeah, for me too. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Keep an eye out for our next Jesuit community profile in the coming weeks. Until then, be well.